The Bhagavad Gita is the most beloved scripture of India, a scripture of scriptures. It is the Hindu's holy testament or Bible, the one book that all masters depend upon as a supreme source of scriptural authority. Bhagavad Gita means Song of the Spirit, the divine communion of truth realization between man and his creator. The teachings of spirit through the soul that should be sung unceasingly. The pantheistic doctrine of the Gita is that God is everything. Its verses celebrate the discovery of the Absolute, Spirit beyond creation, as being also the hidden essence of all manifestation. Nature, with her infinite variety and inaccessible laws, is an evolute of the singular reality through a cosmic delusion, Maya, the magical measurer that makes the one appear as many embracing their own individuality, forms and intelligences existing in apparent separation from their creator. Just as a dreamer differentiates his one consciousness into many dream beings in a dream world. So God, the cosmic dreamer, has separated his consciousness into all the cosmic manifestations, with souls individualized from his own one being, endowed with the egoity to dream their personalized existences within the nature-ordained drama of the universal dream. The main theme throughout the Gita is that one should be an adherent of sannyasa, a renouncer of this egoity ingrained through advidya, ignorance, within the physical self of man. By renunciation of all desires springing from the ego and its environments, which cause separateness between ego and spirit, and by reunion with the cosmic dreamer through ecstatic yoga meditation, samadhi, man detaches himself from and ultimately dissolves the compellent forces of nature that perpetuate the delusive dichotomy of the self and spirit. In Samadhi, the cosmic dream delusion terminates and the ecstatic dream being awakens in oneness with the pure cosmic consciousness of the Supreme Being, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. This God realization cannot be attained merely by reading a book but only by dwelling every day on the above truth that life is a variety entertainment of dream movies full of the hazards of duality, villains of evil and heroic adventures with goodness, and by deep yoga meditation, uniting human consciousness with God's cosmic consciousness. Thus does the Gita exhort the seeker to right action, physical, mental, and spiritual, toward this goal. We came from God, and our ultimate destiny is to return to Him. The end and the means to the end is yoga, the timeless science of God-union. Raise the level of consciousness. Extracts from the lectures by Paramahansa Yogananda. A man is not yet a master 
if he is still engaged in the ordinary life battles, those of sensory temptations, desires, habits, identification with the physiology and limitations of the body, restlessness of mental doubts and complexes, and soul ignorance. His perceptions are limited and include consciousness of bodily weight and other physiological conditions of internal sensations arising from activities of the inner organs and of the breath within the body, of sensations of touch, smell, taste, hearing, and sight, of hunger, thirst, pain, passion, attachment, sleepiness, fatigue, wakefulness, and of his mental powers of reasoning, feeling, and willing. The consciousness of this ordinary man is subject to fears about death, poverty, disease, and innumerable other ills. He is bound by attachments to name, social standing, family, race, and possessions. Spiritually, the ordinary man cannot feel his presence beyond the body except in his imagination. In subconsciousness, he sleeps, dreams, and can move in an unreal world of fanciful imaginings. By flights of fancy, he can move through the stars and vast spaces, but only in mind. Such thoughts do not belong to the domain of outer reality. In short, the average human being is conscious only of his body and mind, and of their outer connections. He remains hypnotized by the world delusions, expressed in many ways in ancient and present-day literature, which reinforce his tactic assumption that he is a finite and limited creature. Having descended from omnipresent spirit to the little body, and having become identified with physical imperfections, the soul appears to lose its omnipresence, perfect status. It must battle to overcome all the limitations of the physical world. The soul must dissolve all sense of identification with duality, both the good and the bad conditions that limit the body and all material life. For instance, disease is a state of sailing the boat of life over stormy seas. Health is a state of skimming over a gently stirred sea of being. Wisdom is the state of realizing one's native soul independence of all matter no longer clinging to the fleshly boat of a maya-tossed surface existence. The liberated consciousness of man plunges boldly into the sea of spirit. So long as man concentrates wholly on the changing waves of the alternates of this world of relativity, so long will he forget to re-identify himself with the underlying changeless sea of all protecting spirit. Only in soul realization does he get away from the superficial flux and attain the changeless state, one in which health and disease, life and death, pleasure and pain, and all pairs of opposites appear merely as waves of change, rising and falling, on the ocean bosom of changelessness. Identification of the consciousness with the alternating waves of change is known as restlessness. Identity with changelessness is calmness. The conquest of the soul's calmness over the ego's restlessness advances in four stages. One always restless, never calm. Two, part of the time restless, part of the time calm. Three, 
most of the time calm, occasionally restless. Four, always calm, never restless. These states are elaborated as follows. One, under the control of ego, the characteristic state of the bodily kingdom is restlessness. With restlessness comes the eclipse of discrimination, buddhi. The sense mind, manas, under complete control of ego and desire, makes no effort to fight evil and to bring back the noble general calmness as the protector of the fortress of life. The mind therefore suffers from continuous restlessness, inefficiency, and ignorance. 2. In the second stage of psychological battle, King Soul occasionally attains a temporary victory in the enemy kingdom of restlessness and ignorance. This stage is reached when calmness makes long, strenuous efforts to bombard the ramparts of restlessness. His guns and the regularly repeated continuous sieges of months of deep meditation. In this state, the bodily kingdom is still infested with restlessness, broken occasionally by calmness. Three, in the third stage of psychological battle, general calmness and his soldiers by repeated invasions with the big guns of deep and continuously higher meditation are able to advance significantly farther into the territory occupied by restlessness. The glorious result of this battle is made known by a state of prolonged peace. The bodily kingdom experiences only occasional outbreaks from the rebels of restlessness. Four, in the fourth stage of the psychological battle, King Ego and all his soldiers are completely routed. The peaceful kingdom of King Soul is forever established as the empire of life. In a body and mind ruled by King Soul and his discriminative faculties, all rebels have met their just fate decapitation the enemy's ego fear anger greed attachment pride desires habits temptation no longer lurk in the secret subconscious sellers to plot against the rightful king the peaceful realm manifests nothing but abundance harmony and wisdom no disease failure or consciousness of death dwell in the bodily realm under the reign of King Soul. A method of attaining victory. The practical metaphysician, in the course of his attempts to free his soul from material bondage, learns the exact methods for victory. By consistently right thoughts and actions, in harmony with divine law, the soul of man ascends slowly in the course of natural evolution. The yogi, however, chooses the quicker evolution hastening method, scientific meditation, by which the flow of consciousness is reversed from matter to spirit through the same cerebrospinal centers of life and divine consciousness that channeled the soul's descent into the body. Even the novitiate meditator quickly finds that he is able to draw upon the spiritual power and consciousness of the inner world of soul and spirit to enlighten his bodily kingdom and activities, physical, mental, and spiritual. The more adept he becomes, the greater the divine influence. As the yogi's consciousness moves ever upward from body consciousness to cosmic consciousness, he experiences the following. Stages of progress toward superconsciousness. 
First, by the practice of guru-given meditation, the aspiring yogi is strengthened in his resolve to find God through self-realization. He no longer wishes to remain identified with worldliness, subject to the limitations of the body and the delusions of nature's opposites of life, death, joy, sorrow, health, disease. With newly awakened discrimination, the yogi is able to free his consciousness from egoistic attachment to his earthly possessions and his little circle of friends. His motive is not a limited and negative one of denial, but a natural expansion toward all-inclusiveness. He severs limiting mental attachments that they stand not in the way of his perception of the omnipresent. After achieving his goal, the love of the perfect yogi includes not only his own family and friends, but all mankind. The ordinary human being is the loser by attachment to a few persons and things, all of which he must forsake at death. The wise yogi therefore first reclaims his divine birthright. Then he finds flowing to him all needful experiences and possessions. Second, though the yogi finds his consciousness free of all external attachments, it still clings tenaciously within to body consciousness when he tries to meditate on God. Experiences of peace and intuitive flashes of the bliss to come encourage him to persevere against the resistance of restlessness and of the ensuing doubts as to whether his efforts are truly worthwhile. Third, by deep concentration on yoga techniques, the yogi next tries to silence the internal and external body sensations so that his thoughts may focus solely on God. Fourth, by the right technique of life force control, pranayama, the yogi learns to quiet his breath and his heart. He withdraws his attention and his life energy into the spinal centers. Fifth, when the yogi can quiet his heart at will, he enters super consciousness. The ego experiences joy and relaxation when it feels in peaceful sleep the subconscious mind. In the sleep state, the heart still works pumping blood through the blood vessels while the senses are asleep. When in meditation, the yogi consciously withdraws his attention and energy from his heart, muscles, and senses. These all remain as though asleep but he has passed beyond the subconscious sleep state of mental awareness into superconsciousness. Such conscious sensory motor sleep bestows on the yogi a joy greater than that of a million ordinary dreamless sleeps, greater than that of any sleep a man might experience after many days of enforced sleeplessness. In the state of superconsciousness, Man's perceptions are internalized rather than externalized. An analogy will explain this. The yogi's experiences in the state of superconsciousness. Man may be said to possess two bundles of searchlights, one inner and one outer. The ego, or body identified consciousness, holds five outer sensory searchlights of sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch. And the soul holds five inner searchlights that reveal God and the true nature of creation. A searchlight reveals only objects in front of it, not those behind. The outer searchlights of the senses turned toward matter, 
reveal to the ego only the various forms of transient and external material objects, not the vast kingdom within. The ego, with its attention identified with the five outer senses, thus becomes attached to the world of matter and its gross limitations. When in superconscious meditation, the heart is calmed, and the yogi can stimulate at will the spiritual center of the medulla, or point between the eyebrows. He can control the inner and outer searchlights of perception. When he switches off the lights of the gross senses, all material distractions vanish. Then the ego automatically turns to behold, through the reinforced inner searchlights held by the soul, the forgotten beauty of the inner astral kingdom. The heart quieted yogi in super consciousness becomes able to see visions and great lights, to hear astral sounds, and to become identified with a vast dimly lighted space, alive with glimpses of beauty hid hereto unknown. In the external conscious state, man does not see God's active manifestation as the beautiful cosmic energy that is present in every point of space and that constitutes the luminous building blocks of every object. He perceives only the gross dimensional forms of human faces, of flowers, and of other beauties of nature. The soul coaxes man to turn his attention searchlights inward to behold, through its astral vision, the ever-burning, ever-changing, multicolored lights of the fountain of cosmic energy playing through the pores of all atoms. The physical beauty of a face or of nature is fleeting. Its perception depends on the power of the physical eyes. The beauty of cosmic energy is everlasting and can be seen with or without the physical eyes. God makes a grand display of cosmic energy in the astral realm of vibratory light. The astral loveliness of roses, scenery, heavenly faces, all play their infinitely fascinating roles of ever-changing colors on the stage of the astral cosmos. Beholding this panorama, the yogi can never again be foolishly attached to the changeable objects of the bedimmed beauty in nature, nor expect any everlasting beauty from earth. The most exquisite face wrinkles and droops with age. Roses too must wither, mocking man's desire for any eternal beauty in materiality. Death will destroy the buds of youth. Cataclysms will demolish the grandeurs of this earth. But nothing can destroy the splendor of the astral cosmos and of still the finer ideational world from which emanates all cosmic artistry. The astral atoms assume wonderful forms of light at the mere command of the imagination of one in this subtle realm, and disappear when he so wishes. They wake again in an ever new garb of beauty at his call. In superconsciousness, the physical body, which once seemed so solid and vulnerable, takes on a new dimension composed of energy, light, and thought. A marvelous combination of currents emanating from the elemental creative vibrations of earth, water, fire, air, and ether in the subtle cerebrospinal centers. 
The yogi who moves his consciousness to the coccyx, or earth center, feels all solid matter to be composed of the atomic and subatomic energy of life force, prana. When the yogi draws his consciousness and energy to the sacral or water center, he experiences all liquid forms to be composed of rivers of electrons of the subtle life force. When the yogi retires to the lumbar or fire center, he sees all forms of light as made of the cosmic fire of prana. When the yogi retires his consciousness to the dorsal or air center, he sees all gaseous forms and air as made of pure prana. When the yogi is able to place his consciousness within the cervical or ether center, he perceives that the subtle etheric background on which grosser forces are imprinted is made of sparks of cosmic intelligent life force or prana. When the yogi retires into the medulla center and into the point between the eyebrows, he knows all matter, energy, and intelligent prana to be composed of thought force. These two centers in the brain are electrical switches of life force and consciousness that are responsible for the creation of the super vitaphone picture of the body through the action of earth, fire, water, air, and ether, the five elements that compose all matter. The profound cosmological branch of the yoga science, dealing with the true nature of the macrocosm of the universe and the microcosm of man's body, is treated extensively in various Hindu scriptures and will be discussed further in interpretation of other related Gita verses. Persons whose knowledge comes through books and not through intuition may often speak of matter as thought, yet still remain grossly attached to the body and material limitations. Only the yogi whose knowledge is based on experience, not on imagination, the yogi who can withdraw his consciousness as well as his life force from the body by quieting the heart, taking them through the cerebral spinal centers to the point between the eyebrows is developed enough to say, all matter is thought. Unless consciousness and energy reach the medullary plane, all matter will be experienced as solid, real. Quite different from thought, no matter how fervently one intellectualizes otherwise. Only upon reaching the medullary plane through self-realization acquired by years of yoga practice with the aid of a guru, is one enabled truly to proclaim that all matter is merely the condensed thoughts or visualized dreams of God. And only when one goes beyond superconsciousness to cosmic consciousness can one demonstrate the dream thought nature of matter. A legendary story here will illustrate the matter is thought point. A great master in India used to travel by foot from village to village with many disciples. At the devotional plea one day of their host, the saint ate meat. He told his disciples, however, to take only fruit. The whole group then undertook a long march through the woods to another village. A disgruntled disciple began to spread discontent by saying, the master who preaches the non-existence of matter himself eats meat. He gives us only watery, unsubstantial food. 
Certainly he can march without fatigue. Hasn't he good meat in his stomach? We are tired. The fruits we ate were all digested long ago. The master sensed this criticism, but said nothing until the group arrived at a cottage where a blacksmith was making nails from molten iron. Can you eat and digest everything I can? The master inquired of the troublemaking student. Thinking the master was going to offer him meat, which he saw roasting on a fire nearby, the student answered, Yes, sir. The master bent over the fire of the blacksmith, pulling out with his bare fingers some of the red-hot nails, still pliably soft from the intense heat. The master began to eat them. Come, son, he remarked encouragingly. Eat and digest. To me, all foods, meat or molten nails, are identically the same. They are spirit. Unnecessary warning to students is this. Do not think you are spiritually advanced just because you have heard a lecture or read a book on cosmic consciousness, or because you fancy yourself to have attained it, or even because you have experienced astral visions, entertaining and enlightening, but still in the domain of matter. You can know all matter to be thought only when you are able to withdraw life force and consciousness to the medullary plane and can enter the spiritual eye the doorway to the highest states of consciousness. Excerpts from the book God Talks with Arjuna by Paramahansa Yogananda.